we welcome you to worship today. And as we do so, we acknowledge that Calvary United Church stands on Treaty 6 territory. We pay our respects to our elders, both past and present, wherever we find ourselves this morning. We recommit to our status as an affirming ministry within the United Church of Canada and strive to be an open-minded, inclusive, and welcoming place of worship. It is our deepest hope that all people might feel at home in this space, and we give thanks to God for this Sabbath day where we join our hearts and minds in prayer. Our worship service today will guide us as Good Friday always does on a journey through Jesus' final moments. But this year, as throughout the previous weeks of Lent, we will look at this story through the eyes of Peter. Peter, he was Jesus' disciple and friend, and he was a complex and deeply human character. He was devout and resolute, zealous and rash, fearful and flawed. As such, if any of us can locate ourselves within this crucifixion story, it is likely through Peter that we can do so. For in him, we most often clearly see ourselves. This is a service of confession, of lament, and of repentance. Through Peter's experiences of life, faith, doubt, and hope, we'll be called to consider our own. We will look closely at the events of that day in such a way that we might honestly assess who we are as faithful followers of Christ today. As Jesus tells Peter the truth about himself, we will be called to consider the truth about ourselves. James Baldwin once said, Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So friends, as we face this difficult day, may we trust in God's power and willingness to bind our wandering hearts to God's own self. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already decided that Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, would betray Jesus. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the supper, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but it is entirely clean, and you are clean, though not all of you. 
for he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had reclined again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, slaves are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things and are blessed if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But it is to fulfill the scripture, the one who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I tell you this now before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Very truly I tell you, whoever receives one whom I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. This all feels so strange. What does Jesus mean? What does he mean by saying that unless he washes us, we have no part with him? And not all of us are clean. He got down on his knees and washed our feet. Everyone knows that only the lowest of servants does that job. It's not the job of rabbi, Never mind someone like Jesus, the man we call Lord and Teacher. It was, it was embarrassing. But even though I don't understand why he did it, the one thing I do know is that I trust him. I would give up anything to follow him. I have given up everything to follow him. Is that not a sign enough for him of my love? He needed to do this washing thing too? But still there was something different about him. He sounded so strange. What does he know that we don't know? What is he not saying? What is he not telling us? When he had gone out, Jesus said, now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, Where I am going, you cannot follow me, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. The last three years of my life have been a whirlwind. I've tried to listen to everything Jesus has said. Listen and remember but this night he seems so sad. It hurts my heart to see him like this. He gave us a commandment to love each other as he has loved us. I'm not sure I could ever love another the way I'm growing to love Jesus. But if I could love him, so open, so welcoming, I would do it. His love changed my life, and I know it can change the lives of so many. But when he started saying that he was only going to be with us for a little while longer, I started to panic. 
I followed him this far. Why wouldn't I follow him to the very end? And for him to say that I will deny him not once but three times, I was shocked and hurt. I would die for him, and he knows it. How could he think otherwise? After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers, together with the police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. And he asked them, whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these people go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? I've never been so angry. We just went to the garden to pray, that's all. Then out of nowhere, the soldiers rush in. I had promised Jesus that I would defend him, and I did. There was no way I was going to let them take him away. So I grabbed my sword and struck the high priest. It had been a long time since I'd acted so violently. But how could I not have? I had to do something, didn't I? Wouldn't you have? The look on Jesus' face was, I don't know, not sorrow, not disappointment. It was just resignation. As he told me to put down my sword, I knew we were all in trouble. 
so I'm angry. I'm angry at the Romans, but that's not new. I've hated them my whole life. I'm angry at Judas, but that's to be expected. I knew he was up to no good. What hurts is how angry I am with Jesus for not fighting back, for not letting me fight for him. And I'm angry with myself for acting in such a violent way. I should have remembered that he wouldn't want that. He never wanted that. As we acknowledge the many ways violence impacts our lives and the lives of millions around this world, let us turn our hearts to God as we make our confession. Holy One, our world today feels addicted to violence. We lament the proliferation and use of weapons and firearms. We bemoan the staggering statistics of intimate partner violence. We mourn the abuse that our 2SL, GBT, QQIA plus family and friends must endure. And we confess our own complicity in the pain of our neighbors and the violent ways of our world. For we too have uttered harmful things about each other. We have refused to acknowledge another's pain and we have turned a blind eye to those in need. In doing so, we have betrayed the peace you left us through Jesus. We have built war economies that make conflict profitable. We have created societies that justify the violence of food and housing insecurity, racism, discrimination, homophobia, transphobia, and marginalization. God of grace, in this hurting and desperate world, have mercy upon us. Amen. So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. You have to understand, everything was happening so fast. One minute we were all praying and the next thing we know, Jesus' hands are tied and he's taken away from us. I stayed as close to him as I could following in the shadow so not to be seen. John, is that who we assume that was? Knew the high priest, and eventually he was able to get me into the courtyard. And then that woman asking me if I was a disciple. Please, you have to understand. Everything was happening so fast and I was so, I was, I was afraid.
Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him, bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of the disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I'm not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did not I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. My anger and my fear have turned to shame with the sound of that bird. Jesus was right. My Lord, what have I done? Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, He ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now, when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now, it was the day of the preparation for, for the Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Here is your king. And they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked him, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to be crucified. And carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, The King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says, 
they divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And this is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus, were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. When you know the world is grieving and you are partly responsible for that grief, what words of solace can you offer? When you could have done something, anything, and you did nothing, what then can you do to ease the heavy weight of shame? The earth is shaken, and so am I. But do I deserve to grieve? Have I brought this on myself? Have I brought this on him, on us? I have not earned these tears. I do not deserve this catharsis. But what else can I do? I don't know what to do. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there.
Prone to wander, God, I can feel it. Wander from the love I've known. Friends, we are more like Peter than we may like to admit. So today we grieve with him. Today our wandering hearts are heavy. But as we leave this place, we remember our hearts may wander, but they are always tethered to the love of God. God's abundant grace existed for Peter, and it exists for us. God's love will never run out. So go now in peace, trusting that streams of mercy shall find us all. And all God's people said, Amen.